Union Pacific set out to conquer mountain grades with a locomotive so extreme, its fiery exhaust could scorch wooden ties and twist steel rails. Yet it was not even powered by steam. Instead, its jet turbine burned cheap oil and delivered strength unheard of in the 1950s. But every mile it burned left a trail of damage and doubt. Why would the railroad risk its tracks and its future on a gamble this dangerous? Freight trains crossing the Rockies face an unforgiving climb. Union Pacific's main line west of Cheyenne rises more than 1,000 feet in just a few dozen miles, with grades often topping 1%. That number sounds small on paper, but it's a mountain to a train loaded with grain, coal, or steel. Each percent of grade can slash the hauling power of a locomotive by half. In the post-war years, the demand for heavy freight only grew. Factories in the Midwest needed raw materials from the West, and the ports of California sent manufactured goods back East. Every ton counted, and every mile of steep track threatened to bottleneck the entire system. Route planners and engineers studied the numbers. A typical diesel-electric locomotive of the early 1950s could muster around 3,000 horsepower, but on the climb out of Cheyenne, that was not enough. To keep a train weighing 6,000 tons moving up a 1.14% grade east from Ogden, conventional engines had to be lashed together in groups, sometimes three, four, or even more. The strain showed everywhere, overheated traction motors, slipping wheels, and delays that rippled across the network. Union Pacific's operating maps were filled with trouble spots. Sherman Hill, just west of Cheyenne, was notorious. Trains crawled up the incline, burning fuel and time. Dispatchers watched as schedules slipped and sidings filled with waiting cars. The economics were brutal. More locomotives meant more crews, more maintenance, and more fuel. Every added unit to a consist was a new expense. The railroad's leadership knew the numbers could not keep climbing forever. They needed a leap, a way to pull more weight with fewer engines, to conquer the mountains without multiplying costs. The challenge was not just about horsepower, it was about endurance. On a long grade, even a small train could stall if the engines lost their grip. Wet rails, icy mornings, or a heavy rain could turn a routine climb into a rescue operation. A single breakdown could block the line for hours. Union Pacific's engineers understood the stakes. They had to find a solution that would deliver sheer, relentless power, enough to muscle the heaviest freight over the highest passes, day after day, in all conditions. By the early 1950s, the search for that solution was urgent. The diesel revolution had solved some problems, but not the biggest ones. The mountain grades still demanded more. The answer, some believed, might lie in technology borrowed from the skies a machine that could unleash power on a scale the rails had never seen. General Electric's prototype gas turbine locomotive arrived on Union Pacific Rails in January 1952. It did not just sit in a roundhouse for engineers to admire. In just two years, the demonstrator racked up more than 106,000 miles, hauling real freight across the harshest stretches of the Western Main Line. Every trip was a test of reliability, of power, and of nerve. Crews logged their experiences as the turbine thundered up Sherman Hill and rolled through the Wyoming wind. The numbers told a story that diesel and steam could not match. Where a fleet of diesels might have strained to move a heavy consist, the turbine prototype delivered horsepower that seemed almost limitless. Union Pacific's leadership did not just watch from the sidelines, they visited the yards, rode in the cabs, and studied the maintenance reports. The railroad's executive team, men like President A.E. Stoddard, understood the stakes. The post-war boom was filling the tracks with more freight than ever. Every delay, every bottleneck meant lost revenue. If this new machine could deliver, it offered more than just a technical solution. It promised a competitive edge. The decision was not made in a boardroom vacuum. The prototype's performance forced a choice. Stick with the familiar or leap into the unknown. 
Union Pacific chose the leap. They placed an order for a fleet of production turbines, betting millions of dollars and the reputation of the railroad on a technology that, just a few years earlier, had belonged to jet bombers and power plants. No other major American railroad was willing to go this far. Where others saw risk, Union Pacific saw necessity. The mountain grades would not get any flatter, and the competition would not wait. The commitment to turbines locked Union Pacific onto a new path. Engineers and shop crews prepared for a future built around machines that sounded like jet engines and promised to pull more tonnage faster and farther than anything that had come before. The railroad's investment signaled more than just a purchase order. It was a declaration that the old limits no longer applied. With the prototype's trial behind them, Union Pacific was all in. The era of the turbine had begun. Inside the veranda's long metal frame, the heart of the machine whirred at a fixed, furious pace. Unlike a steam locomotive, where fire and water created bursts of pressure, or a diesel, where pistons hammered out power and pulses, the gas turbine inside the GTL ran at a relentless 4,860 revolutions per minute. There was no idle, no throttle to ease the strain. Once started, the turbine spun at full speed, its 16-stage compressor gulping air and cramming it into 10 combustion chambers. Here, fuel mixed with air and burned in a steady, controlled inferno, more like a jet engine than anything found on rails before. The design was simple in concept, but radical for railroading. Air entered the front, compressed through a cascade of spinning blades, then met a continuous stream of atomized fuel. The result was a roaring column of hot gas, surging through the turbine stages and blasting out the exhaust. This process never paused. As long as the locomotive was running, the turbine kept burning, kept spinning, kept producing that river of heat. Even when the train slowed or stopped, the turbine did not rest. Power output was managed by adjusting the electrical load, not by changing the turbine's speed or temperature. This constant combustion cycle created a problem no steam or diesel crew had ever faced. The exhaust, measuring over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, had to go somewhere. In the veranda design, it was directed straight down, just inches above the rails and ties. It was not just hot air, it was a blast furnace aimed at the track. Wooden ties, soaked with decades of creosote, were suddenly exposed to temperatures twice the ignition point of dry wood. Steel rails, designed to flex under heavy loads, now faced thermal expansion from below. Ballast stones, meant to anchor the track, could crack or even fuse under the onslaught. The unique sidewalkways that earned the locomotive its nickname were not a stylistic flourish. Engineers at General Electric and Union Pacific knew the turbine's midsection was a danger zone. The walkways kept crews clear of the hottest panels, where even the paint could blister. Instrumentation panels and access doors were moved outboard, away from the turbine's core, to protect workers from accidental burns during inspections or repairs. Every maintenance task had to account for the relentless heat radiating from the engine center. The physics of the turbine cycle made this heat output unavoidable. Unlike internal combustion engines, where exhaust comes in bursts, a gas turbine's exhaust is a continuous flood. The only way to get that much power from a machine this compact was to accept the consequence, a stream of superheated gas with nowhere to go but down. The veranda's design solved the power problem, but it created a new challenge for the rails themselves a challenge no one could ignore once the turbines began to run day and night across the western main line. Standing beside the GTEL veranda, even seasoned railroaders felt dwarfed. The locomotive stretched out over 132 feet, longer than a city bus convoy, its frame towering above the heads of anyone on the ballast. The full AB set weighed in at roughly 850,000 pounds, that is the mass of more than 400 average cars, all packed into a single rolling machine. When the veranda rolled through a yard, 
the ground seemed to tremble. The rails groaned under its weight. The sheer bulk pressed into the earth, steel wheels biting into track that had to be reinforced just to handle the strain. The numbers only hint at the experience. Approaching the veranda as it idled, the first thing that hit was the sound. Not the chuff of a steam engine or the steady thrum of a diesel, but a high-pitched roar. Like standing beside a jet preparing for takeoff. The turbine's whine cut through every other noise. Crewman described it as a constant metallic scream, vibrating through the cab and echoing off canyon walls. Even with the doors sealed, conversation inside could be a challenge. Earplugs weren't optional. They were survival gear. Heat radiated from the locomotive's midsection, shimmering the air above the walkways. The veranda's distinctive side porches weren't just for show. They gave crew a narrow path to move along the engine, deliberately set away from the hottest zones. Anyone who stepped too close to the panels near the turbine risked a burn, even with gloves on. Paint blistered and peeled from the bodywork, a permanent reminder of the inferno inside. Metal handrails along the walkways grew warm to the touch after just a few minutes of operation. The fuel tender trailed behind, a massive insulated tank holding 24,000 gallons of heavy oil. The tank alone was longer than a semi-trailer and weighed as much as a small locomotive when full. Fuel lines snaked from the tender to the engine, each one wrapped and heated to keep the thick, tar-like oil flowing. When the veranda started up, clouds of vapor sometimes drifted from the tender as the heaters did their work, adding another layer to the sensory assault. From the engineer's seat, the view down the length of the veranda was a study in scale. Gauges lined the control panel, each tracking a system under stress. The floor vibrated with the relentless spin of the turbine at nearly 5,000 revolutions per minute. The sensation was constant, no idle, no pause, just a steady surge of power waiting to be unleashed. Every control felt oversized, built to withstand the forces at play. Trackside, bystanders felt the heat and heard the roar before the train even came into sight. The veranda's passage left a wake of hot, shimmering air. At night, the glow from the exhaust cast an eerie light on the rails, flickering off the creosote-soaked ties. The experience was unforgettable, a machine too large, too loud, and too hot to ignore. For anyone who worked around it, the veranda was more than a locomotive. It was a force of nature, imposing its presence on everything in its path. The veranda's 8,500 horsepower was a number that railroaders could hardly believe. On paper, it meant one locomotive could do the work of nearly three top-tier diesel electrics from the same era, a dramatic increase in power. Train dispatchers and operating economists saw a chance to reduce the endless parade of engines needed to conquer the grades of the West. The math looked simple. Fewer locomotives, fewer crews, less time lost to breakdowns or delays. But every revolution of the turbine came at a steep price. The GTEL guzzled fuel at a rate nearly double that of a comparable diesel electric. The 24,000 gallon tender emptied far faster than anyone liked to admit. Hauling a heavy consist over Sherman Hill, the turbine burned through Bunker Sea oil so quickly that the cost savings from its raw power began to vanish. Fuel economists tracked every ton mile, watching as the advantage in horsepower was chipped away by the relentless appetite of the turbine. The promise of unmatched pulling power came shackled to a vulnerability that no amount of engineering could erase. The veranda's strength was always balanced on the razor edge of fuel economics. Heat poured out of the turbines with a force that overwhelmed even the boldest engineering. General Electric's teams tried to outsmart the laws of physics with a toolkit of fixes. Heat deflectors, angled metal shields, were bolted beneath the exhaust ports, meant to push the blast away from the ties. Crews added exhaust diffusers, hoping a wider spread would cool the flow before it reached the ground. 
In some stretches, Union Pacific even experimented with swapping in fire-resistant ballast or treating ties with special coatings. Trackside inspections followed each new tweak, searching for signs of improvement, less charring, fewer warped rails, cooler ballast. But the numbers told a stubborn story. The exhaust still topped 1,000 degrees, and the fixes only delayed the damage. Engineers recalled long nights in the field, watching as their best ideas melted into the same old outcome, scorched earth under a machine that refused to compromise. The ingenuity was real, but the problem refused to budge. Every patch bought a little time, nothing more. In October 1973, the world's oil markets convulsed overnight. The OPEC embargo sent crude oil prices skyrocketing, climbing from $3 to $12 per barrel in just weeks. For Union Pacific, the math was unforgiving. The GTEL verandas, already burning twice as much fuel as a diesel locomotive, became instant liabilities. The cheap Bunker C oil that once made their appetite tolerable now cost more than refined diesel. Every mile run by a turbine drained the railroad's budget at a rate no executive could justify. Crews watched as orders came down, sidelined the turbines, switched to diesels, cut losses. In boardrooms, the verdict was swift and without nostalgia. The era of turbine power ended not in a blaze of innovation, but in a cold calculation. In the wake of the oil shock, reliability and efficiency would rule the rails. The verandas, once symbols of ambition, became relics almost overnight, their fate sealed by forces far beyond the control of any railroad. Decades later, the scars from those turbine giants still mark Union Pacific's rails. As railroads weigh ever bolder technologies, autonomous trains and hydrogen engines, the trade-off between raw power and lasting impact remains urgent. History shows that pushing limits brings both progress and risk. The real challenge now is not just moving freight faster, but ensuring the tracks we lay can bear the future we build. What would you risk for progress? Drop your thoughts below.